Hello, welcome back. Look at this beautiful weather. We've had two weeks like this with no rain. And in the forecast, I can look at the forecast and be confident that I can put stuff outside all day and not have to worry about it getting rained on. It's quite, quite nice. Yeah, I know all you people from New Mexico and Arizona and Nevada or whatever are saying, oh, that's no big deal, but hey, it is kind of a big deal. Anyway, so in the last episode, we were going a bit spare, uh, having to do all this kind of customization of bolts and chopping the heads off and flattening them and making them narrower and stuff. So I thought in this video, um, we could start off by, oh, yeah. So we're going to start off here by customizing 74 bolts. <laughs> well, it's not as bad this time because we don't need to customize the heads. And technically we don't really need to customize, we could go and buy them, because you can buy those ones. These ones I'm not sure if you can buy in 5x12. But I have a lot of these left over because I had to change the lengths of something. These are in 5x25 I think. But we're just going to be shortening the threaded part here. And we're going to be doing it using this uh, Dremel which goes in this stand like that. And I've drilled and counterboard a hole here so that the head of the bolt is just poking through a little bit further so that when I put it down like that it's actually going to be touching the aluminium behind and it's going to be nice and easy to slide and then I can just adjust the height of this to wherever I need and then go chop 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 and hopefully this particular customization job will be quite nice and easy um, and we also have to customize some of the M8 bolts because these ones as it turns out they're just a little bit too long they only just poke through but that's still too much because the clearance needed under there is almost nothing. So the reason that we need to shorten so many of these bolts is that um, I didn't realize when I was designing it that the, the M5 tap here is actually going to be the limiting factor on how much thread we can get into. Because all I was really thinking about is how much material we have behind where the hole's going. So for these bolts here, for example, there's going to be 12 millimeters of the plate and then behind it there's going to be what looks like another 12 millimeters or so. Um, and when I was making the MDF mock-up, of course, I didn't use taps or anything for that. I just drilled the hole at the size that you would normally drill it for tapping if it was aluminium. And then you just drive the bolt straight in and you can make, make it as deep as you like. So the, the MDF mock-up actually didn't alert me to this problem. And the problem is, of course, that there's only a certain amount of thread on there that you can like make, make thread in the holes. And it becomes even more of a problem in places like this where we have counterbores. So we're actually losing another five or six millimeters there, that means we need to get this five or six millimeters further in before it's actually compressing that plate against the one behind it. Uh, another issue is these things here, the holes in these, they're only six millimeters deep, and I would like to use all of that six millimeters if I can, which means that, so six millimeters for the hole, and then these two plates here are six millimeters each as well, so that's going to be 18 millimeters ideally, and you can buy 16 millimeter bolts, but that's giving away two millimeters, so you'd only, it would only be four millimeters of bolts sticking into the carriage like about that much. It's not much, so I'd like to like do a little bit of customization so I can get the extra two millimeters in all of them. Um, and there's also a situation on the inside there where we need basically the same thing. I had a comment one time that when you're chopping the thread of a bolt like this, it's a good idea to put a nut on it so that when you've chopped it off, the thread at the end, it might be, if it's a little bit damaged, you can just bring that nut back and it will kind of thread itself a little bit again to repair the damage. But what I've found is that if you're doing it with an abrasive wheel like this, you really don't have that problem. Uh, if you try that with a hacksaw though, yeah, be prepared for problems. So that little cutting disc on the Dremel was just not going fast enough. I don't know why it's so super slow. Maybe this stainless steel is just really hard and it wears the disc down faster than the steel. That's what it seems like anyway. So all I did was use that to mark a little mark. And then I, for the rest of the cutting I've been using the angle grinder with the cutoff wheel. And the problem with that is that you do get the problem where you mess up the threads if you're not careful. And I don't want to put the nut on there and bring it back to get them out. Um, I found a better way to do it. So what, the way it works is with the angle grinder, the problem is that it's very tempting to just blast straight through it very quickly because the angle grinder has a lot of power and you can do that. But the problem is that you get heat into the, the metal and it gets soft and as you're pushing it right out the opposite side when you're cutting just that last little bit, 
it smears or it smudges the threads outwards. Um, but what I found is you can do a very good job, almost not needing any cleanup after, afterwards, if you just wait a little bit at the end. So right before you cut that last little bit, you just stop and give it uh, I don't know, five seconds or so to cool down a bit. And then you just tickle that last little bit off now that the heat's all gone. Uh, that might not work. Okay, so that one didn't quite work, but you saw what I was trying to do there. Dang it. It's close. It'll need a little bit of belt sanding. The nice thing about these larger bolts is it's easy to see what the problem is. See there? So that's going to take uh, two seconds on the belt sander. And then should be good to go now. Yeah. Alright, so I didn't quite do it there, but sometimes I've managed to do that. Okay, I've just been redoing these panels here, the top and the bottom, or shelves or whatever. This one was MDF before, which was not really what I wanted, and it wasn't stuck down properly like that either, so I just did that out of 12mm plywood. And this one up here, I wanted this to be lamp panel, 12mm lamp panel, but uh, the lamp panel is a little bit expensive, so I thought I'd just go with what I had, which is a 7mm plywood, and also stick that down properly here as well. And my next job, I think, for today is to try and make some sort of a monitor stand. We're just going to start off on this and then do something up here. And what, <laughs> what I want to do, ideally, is I want to have it so that there's a keyboard and the monitor sitting there together. And I can just put them about here most of the time. But then sometimes I'm going to want to bring them here-ish. Probably wouldn't be re realistic to get much further than about here. But I'd also like, the, like it to be able to move around anywhere in that radius and also swivel around like that as well. And the reason I want to bring it here is because when the gantry is further down here and I'm trying to adjust something, I will probably be using the keyboard a little bit. Um, I'm also thinking about maybe trying to make a Bluetooth game controller um, for it. So if that happens, I won't be using the keyboard so much. But Anyway, to achieve that, there's a couple of ways you could do it. The problem is that we want, we want it to move to and fro in this direction, like distance-wise, but then we also want it to rotate. So in box 2D parlance, that would be a, a linear joint. No, what's it called? Prismatic joint and a revolute joint, which is um, one way we could do that is with these two. So this Lazy Susan thing and these drawer slides, which I bought for some reason a few years ago and never used them for anything but I don't think that's going to be strong enough um, so the other way you could do it is with two two longer bars that are joined to each other with a vertical revolute joint in the middle and I just realized that the jack handle that I'm going to start with comes from this jack which I still have around and I was going to resurrect this but I gave up on it I, I actually bought oil for it and I bought the seals that were supposed to fix the problem that it was leaking. Oh, in there. Oh, look, somewhere it was leaking. But no, it just wasn't having any of it, so I ended up buying a new jack. But anyway, this uh, has a lot of the kind of things that I was just saying, like swivelly bits on it that could be useful for something, maybe. And it's also quite strong. So I'm just sort of thinking about what I might be able to do with this. Okay, so that all just comes apart. The two sides are held together by three like pins like that and uh, starting to look like it might be useful for something we also get so these are the other two pins here and we get some like hard plastic bushing things a spring another pin and uh, wheels like this with a steel bushing in them and uh, there's got to be something useful we could do with this okay I have a cunning plan so we're going to chop this piece where the black line is there and we're keeping this part. This is going to be welded on there. It might be wise to put a little bit of a strut in between it too, right about where my finger is there. And that's going to be swiveling on the bench edge. This pin here is going to be going into this bit. And we're going to cut along the black lines here. We're going to throw away this bit, keep that bit, throw away that bit, and keep that bit. And we're also going to cut along that black line there so that this bit is nice and flat, or pretty much flat, we can't really do much about that bit there, but it's going to be almost flat there, and that's where the monitor is going to sit, and it will be able to swivel 
all the way around like this, at least when we chop that bit off, it'll be able to go all the way around that way as well. It's not, not too bad distance wise, it'd be nice to have a little bit more, but I think I'll just go with this and see, see how it works out. Well, I don't know what kind of steel this is, but it welds like a dream. This is, it almost looks like somebody else did this. <laughs> Mind you, I am, I am getting slowly better at welding, of course, but still, this is definitely way, way easier to weld than the uh, steel that I was using for the table. Yep, I can put it. <laughs> Should be able to put this anywhere, anywhere in this region now. And the, the two joints, or well, actually three joints. One way, one way or another, those three joints should conform to. Oh, I can't. Oh, yeah, I can get it there. So to mount the keyboard and the monitor onto the end of this arm, I was originally thinking to make a sort of a panel from this. Uh, just chop it down and make it a bit smaller, weld that into a convenient size for keyboard and mouse and then just put a piece of plywood on top of that. And I was thinking just to put the monitor on top of that as well but I dismantled this piece that the back of the monitor is stuck on and it looks like this is aluminium going up through the middle of there but underneath that was a piece of steel um, which looks fairly sturdy and the main four bolts there, or four screws or whatever, are what go into the bottom of that and hold everything on. So this is quite convenient for me because what I could do now is just weld it straight onto there. Uh, to clear these holes, I'll have to make a little indent in here to clear those holes, but otherwise I think that should work quite nicely. There we go. So that piece that was the foot of the monitor is actually now just for the keyboard and mouse area and the monitor itself is going into this bit here directly. Okay so here's how that turned out. It's good enough for now I think but I think <laughs> I will also probably want to come back and get something a little bit better in the future. Maybe. No, nope, probably not. <laughs> um, so we've got a couple more struts on here and the reason I added those is that I realized that um, it's all very well when this arm and this arm are in a straight line because then the force is going to be trying to bend this piece like that, right? But when you put it around to 90 degrees like this, then that force or the weight there is going to be trying to twist this piece like that. And it didn't really have much resistance at all to that, that twisting and it was uh, looking a bit weak there so I put a couple more struts on the sides to, to connect directly from here to here and that fixed that pretty good uh, looks a bit ugly in there doesn't it but anyway we can um, move it around like this and the reach is it's okay like even if, if the gantry was all the way back here it's still a pretty easy reach for the keyboard there I decided to make the keyboard come right to the edge and I'm going to be gluing on a piece of something like this on the bottom there to keep this plywood straight because it's actually not supported past about this point as we'll see if we look underneath there see there's nothing on the ends that little bit of steel is only in the middle so this will go on here and it will make make it easier to grab as well because there's really nothing to grab onto here this bit's kind of slippery and flimsy and because the keyboard's so close you can't really grab it like that very easily I mean, it's like, well, I guess you could go like that yeah but anyway it just needs something to grab on there and um, then it'll be okay it's a bit wobbly like actually moves around fairly easily but in certain positions like where it is now it'll be tilting tilting down on that side and then if I move it over here a little bit 
so now it's off to that side now it's tilting that way and I think that just depends on the angle of these last two uh, this bit here this joint whether this is going where it is now or whether it's going the other way uh, and if you get it sort of in the middle then it'll be level like about about here somewhere is level but uh, yeah like I say it'll do for now it's basically exactly what I envis envisioned except it's just a little bit sort of clunky to move although it can go all the way back to here which is nice and then it's completely clear of this bench here like I could put something I could put a tall <laughs> a tall object on here right at the edge of the bench and it wouldn't um, really obstruct too much so that's that's kind of what I was hoping for okay so after chopping off the tips of those bolts that hold the X rails down there I'm able to get the nut block there to slide all the way backwards and forwards and I found to my surprise that it's actually very easy to push the gantry and get it to move and even from just one side like this and the only thing that should move when this happens is the X ball screws which you should see moving and um, I'm probably putting about somewhere between 5 and 10 kilos force on this to do this but the fact that it's so easy and I can do this from one side I think that's a good sign check this out even more amazing I can turn one ball screw and the other one will turn just by that force going through the gantry like this Look. <laughs> so there is a tiny bit of like play or uh, backlash or whatever I guess you could call it like that and then we go back we get oh not even a, not even a quarter turn really before the other one starts moving that's awesome okay so the next task is to take this all apart again and put it back together again but this time it's going to be with my perfectly sized bolts that I made and we're going to be using Loctite this time as well just the purple one uh, low strength Loctite apparently uh, because this is hopefully going to be the last time that everything goes together and while it's apart I'm going to take the opportunity to grease these carriages properly because I haven't done that yet and I'll put the little grease nipple things on there as well and I'll also be greasing the ball screws at, at the same time and over here I want to fix this a little bit, well I want to paint this because I kind of forgot to paint it but that's alright because I have to do a little bit more welding I realized um, this bit here where it joins on originally this was all a solid piece this was on the back that I so I cut that off and because this was here it stopped these two plates here the top and the bottom from kind of separating apart like that and it's kind of a problem if they do separate because that's what's holding it all together so if this one was to come up too much or the one at the bottom was to come down too much you can see that one's actually fairly close to the edge there uh, then the whole thing would just fall on the floor which would be kind of a bummer so I think what I'll do to stop that from happening is I'll just tack a small bit of uh, some scrap piece of rubbish like this well I'll, <laughs> I'll cut it smaller obviously but just this just needs to stick out a bit over the edge so that this can't come up and that one can't go down and then I'll paint this up and uh, it's still going to look pretty ugly but at least a little bit of paint will be better than none this is the other grease that I was talking about that I had like coming in the mail and I ordered this because it's much thicker and it stays in place and seems to be a little bit more suitable for what I'm doing than the spray grease is I don't know why you can't find this in the shop normally though I had to order it in like it's a special order and then they send away and bring it into your branch and whatever anyway uh, I have it now and it seems to be quite good and I got one of these uh, squirt, no, what are they called, grease guns as well. I had a little bit of, bit of confusion with this at first because I didn't realize that you have to press on the nipple here when you're doing it. I kind of thought that because it has this clicking in thing to like stay in place there, and it's quite a strong clicking in, and it's difficult to get it out as well. I kind of thought that was enough. So if you also have to press on it while you're doing it, I don't really see the point of um, having the click in, click out thing. It just seems... A little bit pointless. I'm just about to close up the z-axis section here for hopefully the last time so I'll just give you a quick look at that. The uh, ball screw mounts onto the front plate or middle plate and then the carriages come on here and we've got these six millimeter spacers and a little bit of stout shimmage there and then that's going to be placed over like that.
Okay, so I've finished installing and greasing the carriages on this Z-axis unit and learned a few things about it. Basically this thing here is kind of a waste of time. Um, I was shipped, when I bought this stuff, they gave me just one of these things like that and then there were a whole bunch of these, like as a pair, like they're stuck together. And I tried this one here in the hole at the end of the carriage there, at the bottom there's a hole where you can use this nipple to force grease into there and it fit quite nicely so I thought okay and then I assumed that these other ones here when they're dismantled like that that they would be the same size so you could do it either way if you wanted this like 45 degree turn or if you just wanted it to be straight and then like that but unfortunately these ones when you dismantle them the thread is a little bit different it's not not quite as big so basically you can't use these in there at all and I only have one that I can use. I don't know why they didn't just ship me eight of those. That would have been nice. Um, the other problem is that this clicky bit there, there's like a little sort of a retaining, um, circ not really a circlet, but, but when you click it onto here, it sticks on there. And it would be good to have an 800 pound gorilla handy to pull that off for you when you need to get it off. Because it goes on easy, but boy is it difficult to get off. Which is a problem because the threads in there are all plastic, so if you're pulling on them like a gorilla, um, probably going to break it. So, <laughs> what I've been doing, oh, and another problem with these is this angle here. Hang on a minute. If you put it like that, this is how I would have wanted to put them, like that. Uh, well, except facing outward, probably. So that when the plate goes on here, it's not going to hit the plate. But then the problem is that there's not enough room to get that grease nozzle on there because the rail's in the way. So I think what, probably what you're supposed to do is have it facing a little more upward, like that. Then you could get the grease gun on it. Yeah, like that. But you wouldn't be able to have a plate coming across here because it would, it would collide with that. So it's just kind of awkward. Uh, so what I've been doing is just got this little syringe and I used the syringe to smear grease all over the balls inside here and then just filled up each end of this with the syringe as well and I'm just going to cap off the ends with a normal small 6mm bolt like they have on the ends there just to just to keep it clean and stop that grease from coming out of there and uh, when I need to re-grease them I'll probably just do it with the syringe again and that'll, that'll have to work I discovered also that these balls they do actually pop out if you're a little bit too firm with them um, for some reason that didn't happen before when I was using the, the brush and a small screwdriver to clean them with the isopropyl alcohol, but when I was trying it last night to grease them up I was a little bit too forceful and they popped out a little bit. But it seems like as long as it's upside down like this, um, and there's also because there was grease on there they didn't really like ping out and fly away and they're quite easy to just press back in there, but you do have to be a little bit careful with them so I've been using the, um, the plastic placeholder fitting thing whenever I'm sliding them on and off the rails just to make sure that the balls don't fall out because that's probably the time that they're most susceptible to um, getting lost. And then if you're gentle you can sort of use this to roll them round. Before the grease gets into the back it's still loose, loose on the other side so they roll a bit easiest but then as the grease goes in it tends to uh, get stiff, so basically I, I don't really want to do it too much more than that. See that, that one just about popped out. <laughs> I just wanted to roll them around a little bit more so I can uh, put, them, put a little bit more grease directly on these ones over here. Actually I'm not entirely sure if this is connected to the inside <laughs> from here into there. I think it is. It should be. Actually, I found a better way to do this because the way I was doing it just before, if you put it all over there and then you put this slider in there, it just kind of smears it backwards and forwards on the front and it doesn't get into the back of the balls very well. But I found that if I more carefully poke each ball in to the end on this side and give it a little squirt with the syringe as they go, then after a while you'll see at the other end here they're coming out with grease on them from the back. So we know that there's grease all the way 
through the back and everything's lubricated nicely. Takes a little bit longer, but not much longer. For the ball nuts, the grease gun was a little bit more useful because the nipple thing fit in there quite nicely and it's steel so you can get a good pull on it to remove it again afterwards. Uh, but the problem is the block here is gets in the way and you can't really get the grease gun on the nipple there so I had to undo this from the nut to grease it which is kind of a nuisance but it worked quite nicely. There was basically not much grease in here at all. Uh, I used just a little bit of Vaseline when I reassembled this one just to help the balls stick in there while I was putting it together and I jammed a whole bunch of grease in there and I was kind of turning the turning the screw like that as I did it and you can see maybe a little bit of the white lithium grease is coming out the other side. Okay those carriages should be greased okay now so let me show you how these Y plates fit together because it is in my opinion quite nifty. So this is the rear plate for the Y axis and this will fit over there and there's about a half a millimeter clearance around here just to let me put it in place and the ball nut here doesn't actually connect to that plate directly it's going to come through and connect to the back of this one with an appropriate clearance I think three millimeters or so there yeah about three millimeters uh, don't need any shim for this one actually which is quite nice now you'll notice that any anywhere we have a head of a bolt poking through from this side or one of these extensions from the the six millimeter bolts that hold the ball screw on here Everywhere there's a gap here, I mean everywhere there's a bolt head here, we have a corresponding clearance hole here. So that's what these larger holes are for. And vice versa. So these four bolt heads that stick out on this side will have a clearance here. Like that. Um, so then we're going to put just eight of these bolts in uh, for now. So there'll be those eight like that. And they all have their clearances for the heads there and then the other ones or the other eight on the outside here we'll actually be able to reach that from the front when we put the the front plate on so we can clamp the clamp the front plate and the back plate together through into the carriage block for those ones and then to connect the ball nut of this axis with the plates here that's what these holes are for and we need to wind wind it to the right place so that the Z plate is in front of the hole there and put the bolt in to secure that. This one over here because it's a little bit off-center um, is not so convenient and the ball screw on the Z axis is kind of blocking it and it's so tight that I can't put the Allen key in vertically I have to angle it a little bit so that it's going down the grooves of that ball screw but if I do that it works. So that sits on there like that and then to connect these together properly we'll put the other eight bolts into the carriages from here and there and this one here is actually threaded on the plate at the back so it's just a, just a short bolt there. I thought I might just add one and then through here we're going to have bolts that clamp them together as well and then same on that side. And what I really like about this situation is that you can completely separate the Z and the Y axis and work on them separately and like completely separately adjust the rails to match the carriages and stuff. And then only at the end like this they come together. And another thing that that means is that we can shim the entire Z axis or tram or whatever by putting shims between these two plates rather than shimming the spindle versus the z-axis plate here uh, because if you if you do that it's a bit of the nothing but you still might end up that um, even though the even though the spindle the cutting head is coming down vertically relative to the table it doesn't move vertically I mean it's <laughs> it's oriented like that but it'll be moving like this if all you're doing is shimming the spindle versus the z-axis and the z-axis is not vertical to the table but with this here and the shim in there we can shim this entire axis. I was putting these little green thingies in here on the Z axis and I noticed that all the bolts on this rail were sticking up a little bit further than the ones on here so these ones I was able to get in quite easily and the best way seems to be just to tap them in with a hammer and a piece of wooden dowel that's a little bit rounded on the end um, but the little plastic bits have a bit of height to them and they, they weren't going in far enough they need to get completely below the level of this so they're about that thick 
And I thought, oh, it doesn't matter, I'll just leave them out. They're only to like stop dust getting built up in there and that's all it is. But then I realized that that's not all they're for. The reason that they're there mainly is so that the grease that is being held captive inside the carriages, as it slides over, if there's no covering on here, the grease will just fill up in that hole. And it's kind of wasted because we don't want the grease in the holes. We want the grease to be going around on the ball bearings. Um, so I found that I could just chop off that little rim on the edge of these and then even even very thin like that they still fit in quite nicely um, in here they don't pull out or anything they're not loose and you still need to tap them in tightly but um, yeah so I think it's a good idea to have those in so for these bearings here I think I'll just lubricate these with some WD-40 just kidding settle down settle down now I think I'll um, I think I'll try this spray lithium grease there on these ones and I didn't clean them with any isopropyl alcohol like I did for the other ones because it seems like they didn't have any like protective stuff on them when they arrived they were just dry and uh, I've been using them a bit already in the MDF machine so I just sprayed them with the compressed air gun to hopefully blow out any dust or whatever might be in the back there and these ball bearings um, spin very nicely you can with the air gun you can spin the uh, spin the race right around it's quite neat Okay, I have the gantry back on the main table now. Uh, greased these bearings here. Had to make these holes larger because I, for some reason I couldn't get this rail over enough to get some proper clearance in there anymore. I'm not, not exactly sure why, um, but everything's fine now. Um, by the way, these little bits here, uh, I hadn't really mentioned what they're for, but they are to fit the bearing block cutouts there at the top just to... Let it travel all the way over here, so we can get to within about four millimeters of the end of the rail. Uh, and also enlarge this here using the jigsaw, so that the Z plate, when it comes along, is going to go into there now. Um, and my next job is just I'm just setting up this bottom rail so that it's the same height all the way across, and then I'll clamp that down nice and tight, and then I'll use that and I'll tighten these bolts. Then after that and then I'll use this plate to align the top rail with the bottom one. Okay, so I got these rails nicely lined up and I've just been measuring from the bed of the table to the bottom of this corner here as I move it across and there's actually no discernible height difference as it goes across which is really nice and uh, I put the front piece on and we seem to have picked up a bit of a nod somehow in that uh, it's not, not quite vertical when I put that there so I'm just using a bit of stout shimmage along the bottom of here to fix that. One really handy feature of the way that these bolt heads come through into the clearance holes on the other side is that even though this is quite heavy, probably weighs about four kilos, as long as I slot it in there, just a little bit of light pressure to push it on means it's not going to fall off. In fact, I could just about let it go. Nope, I can't let it go, but... <laughs> Just to hold it there um, makes it really easy to then put the screws in. Very simple. No. There. Now I can let it go. Okay, that seems to have fixed the nod quite nicely. It might come back again when I put the spindle on because the spindle's almost another four kilos, so it might push it down a bit at the front again. Uh, but it's easy enough to just fix it with a little bit more shim. Um, it's quite nice and square in this side as well. I mean, where that other square is. Um, but if it wasn't, in theory, the way that these plates are separated here, you could also use that to shim it, I mean, tram it in that dimension if you wanted to. But to do that, I'd have to make the holes... Uh, these holes here, I'd have to make them slightly larger so that there was a little bit of movement to be able to do that. And I, I don't want to do that. And it doesn't look like I need to, so that's nice. Actually, it looks like adding the spindle didn't make any difference. It's still nice and straight. And come to think of it, it shouldn't have made any difference, because if it did, that would mean that the machine was uh, not very rigid at all. But fortunately, it seems to be okay. David, I do not leak, you leak, remember? 
Uh, oh, um, yeah, so we're just about done now. Uh, probably less than one day's work if I had all the bits here. I'm still waiting for the belt for the x-axis. Um, otherwise, yeah, probably one day would be enough to get it running. The next step is to put the motors back on and the computer and everything back on. And I'll do the drag chains properly this time and make that nice and tidy. I haven't really thought about how I'm going to secure the waste board here. There's a nice 60 centimeter space here for putting in a board like one of those uh, 60 centimeter width ones that you get from a hardware store pretty easily. But how to stick it down I haven't really decided much about. Um, but yeah, we're pretty close, but uh, this is the end of this video. <laughs> Thanks for watching.